listening to episode 280 of My Life Radio. I'm Matt Blackburn, and today we're doing a coffee chat with John the Savage. I've had him on the show once before talking about bodybuilding. In this coffee chat, it is mostly a free-for-all, just a flowing conversation, but we do hit several topics, including how homesteading is romanticized. I talk about the difficulty of living 100% off the grid. We talk about gardening. John shares the two supplements that he's really been enjoying, which are taurine and vitamin B1. And he shares a little bit about the tannins in coffee and how you want to time certain supplements around that to maximize absorption. We talk about protein consumption, antioxidants, specifically vitamin C, vitamin E, melatonin, why we like those, when we take them, how we take them. We talk about different anxiolytic supplements that are GABA promoting, such as Phenobut and other compounds that John's found in his research. We answer some listener questions, including thoughts on decaf coffee and coffee intolerance, the concept of vitamin A toxicity and why we don't believe in it. Someone asked about sun damage, so we both share our thoughts. John shares why he likes strategic use of sunscreen. We talk about different supplement stacks for different purposes. We covered quite a bit, and I think you'll enjoy it. So here is John the Savage for a coffee chat. Enjoy the show. Okay, we're here with John the Savage. Welcome back to the show. Hey, Matt. Great to be here. Yeah, this is our first coffee chat together. You were on the show before talking about this healthy, sustainable weight training and bodybuilding. That was a fun show. But I thought it'd be cool to just have one where we talk about a lot of our shared interests. We're both doing the homesteading thing. And we both talked about how it's heavily romanticized on social media, where it's kind of like pushed as like the ultimate lifestyle, the ultimate goal that everyone should aspire to having cattle and chickens and goats and a greenhouse and hunt their own food and uh, and grocery stores, you know, should become less reliant on. And I think that can be good, but I don't think it's for everybody. Yeah, absolutely. Like that's something that, you know, just because of social media, you see people doing it and it's like, oh, you know, like these people are going out, they're just getting their eggs. They're just tending to their garden. They're able to basically eat off the land. And, you know, because you're only getting that like snapshot glimpse of their life, you're not really exposed to all the, hours of work that go behind that, whether it be, you know, for example, my case, we moved here a year ago and we got chickens. We moved in April, we got chickens in July and, you know, they're chicks. So we just kept them in the living room until they were big. But, you know, I ended up building their coop and their run. And that was like a month long project. And it's crazy how much of a time investment this sort of stuff is, because especially when it's something outside, you know, you need to factor in things like weather. And it was like comically bad because I remember after finally erecting everything and like putting them in their new home, like I was listening to the radio and like the host mentioned how like, every weekend for the past two months there was rain and those were all the weekends that i would try and be working on it either by myself or i would have friends come over to help me with it and you know it's just it's like it's so quick to be able to put yourself between a rock and a hard place because obviously you know you need to take care of yourself you need to take care of your land whatever animals you have whatever plants you're growing and then obviously you still have to attend to stuff like work if you're not one of these people that you know make their living off of you know just posting this sort of content on instagram like between a job and you know a wife and land now like the majority of my time is taken up yeah and just add 
off grid living to that, <laughs> just what I experienced, which is like a job in itself, mm. especially if you're in a snowy climate like us and the generator breaks, which I've had happen, which is your backup power because you don't have grid power. And me going through three winters of that, especially two winters with goats and one buck called Bartholomew, which has become legendary on my social media. <laughs> it's just such a handful. And like you said, juggling, whether it's, uh, you know, if you're married or a job or just eating and taking care of yourself, it, be, it can become very overwhelming very quickly. Absolutely. Um, so, yeah, I think the, especially for me, <laughs> the off grid aspect of it. And I don't know if I've said on the show yet that I'm going to be moving back on grid, but have off grid capability. And I think that's the best of both worlds. I don't think that you necessarily have to be completely off grid. I think really the value is knowing how to be completely off grid and knowing that you can be if you need to. That's kind of where I'm at. But while civilization's here, while the grid's here, I mean, the grid here in the Pacific Northwest is pretty robust, definitely stronger than in the Southwest where I'm from because Washington is heavily hydroelectric, from my understanding. And even Idaho, there's a lot of running water in northern Idaho, especially. So hydroelectricity, I mean, to me, is way better than solar. And uh, I'm looking to kind of get into those in the next few years, and especially wind power. I have a pretty cool plan for for a wind turbine and, and getting into that. But Awesome. That's a whole another aspect to this is the whole energy mm -hmm. part, because you mentioned chickens and what do you do in the winter when it's negative 20 Fahrenheit or negative 30 Fahrenheit, like it was here last winter, you need a heat source for the chickens. And that's either going to be propane and you're switching out propane tank every couple of days. I did that. Or it's heat lamps, which are 250 watts, which is really energy intensive for off grid living. Yeah, and especially then you run the risk of, you know, something falling and then the heat lamp starting a fire in the coop and that's just, you know, like a whole nother headache. But yeah, no, I remember we were talking about when we initially moved here, like if I had any plans of doing the whole off grid thing. And honestly, as long as it's here, like I'm definitely going to make use of just being able to like not have to worry about electricity. But, you know, we've got a generator here and maybe in the future, I would do some solar panels depending on like, you know, where I could put them and like how it could be routed to the house. But yeah, I think that that like fixation on being completely off grid and self-reliant is just such a slippery slope because as satisfying as it is to be able to say like, listen, like these lights powered by the sun, like, you know, the, the house is getting heated from wood that like I chopped, like as nice as that is like, the time investment's crazy. And I think especially like right after I finished with building the chicken coop and the run, I immediately started working on a greenhouse that's attached to our house because the previous owner, he honestly, like if I never met him, I would just assume he was like some sort of junkie because the entire thing was held together by like Lowe's yardsticks, tape and like plastic wrap. So I had to tear that down, you know, we use like the, the plastic paneling and everything. And then after that, like I immediately went to like redoing the garden because last year we had a deer get into our garden, right. As all of our tomatoes were starting to come out and literally over a single night, we lost basically everything. So, you know, it, it's crazy to say, but like, you know, e even the animals can like really fuck you over, <laughs> but I think. Yeah, it just during that period, because I was so focused on just basically like my job, sleep, and then doing these projects, like my health genuinely took a hit to the point where like I really had to just like stop and like take a step back and just like focus on myself a little bit, I guess. But yeah, at this point, I can say I'm like definitely recovered. But it's crazy to think that like, you know, if you don't know what you're doing and you end up in that slump, then you know, you're kind of stuck in that slump unless you're aware of like, you know, what you need to implement to drag yourself out of it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think there's certain things like I've lived in rentals and I think chickens, even beekeeping 
is pretty, those are probably to me like the easiest homesteading things. And if you're doing raised beds, gardens, but then like you said, the animals <laughs> could decimate, you know, decimate your work for overnight. Um, yeah, that's why I like, it, yeah, go ahead. No, it's, we eat, it's not like we didn't have a fence too. Mm-hmm. So it like literally deer got over the fence and still like, this is like probably without a doubt, like the most traumatic thing to have happened on our homestead since its inception. But it, it's crazy that just like, over a single night, like you can lose months of work. And that's no just like the fence? harsh of rea- <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> but uh, I think if anything happens this year, because we actually, we tore down the old fence, we put up a four foot fence, and then we put these eight foot tall posts like periodically around it. And then we used fishing line to just kind of create like, you know, different levels of, you know, basically line going across. And the idea for that is if the deer walks up to it and bumps into that, he won't see it, but he'll know that there's something stopping him and that would be enough to like deter them. And so far, like, honestly, funny enough, I haven't seen any deer. The tomatoes are still green though. So it's going to be another story when they're red, but hopefully fingers crossed, like, you know, this will, you know, be our saving grace. Yeah, up here, from what I've learned from other homesteaders is they just say the top, you know, that you can buy like the electric wire with the solar panel. And that's what a lot of people use up here, just on the top part of the fence. Mm-hmm. So if the deer touches it, they only have to learn once to get that little zap. And then, you know, they don't go further. Yeah, freak out back into the forest. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and, and the growing dome, it, it's such a huge investment. Like I love the growing spaces greenhouse that I have, but it's definitely the most expensive route to go with growing food. I mean, it's completely secure from bears, deer, mm. you know, ground squirrel, all the stuff I have up here. But it's 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 a huge investment. I think it's worth it. It's just it's kind of like buying solar panels. I mean, the payoff is several decades. Yeah, exactly. And that's also just like, you know, kind of part and parcel of gardening as a whole, because Like, you know, I said we've only been here for a year and there's already starting to be things that I wish we did differently. And the number one is just with the garden. I wish that we really like took time to kind of amend the soil and just prep everything before we started getting into it. Because initially, granted, we did just go with raised beds and we used a really quality mix of the different substrates to make everything as nice as possible. But now we're doing stuff in the ground. And, you know, I'm thinking about it. I was like, damn, like if I tilled this, if I added some like, you know, some sphagnum moss, just that honestly, some shilogy, just some worm casings, just like anything to increase like the life of the soil. I think that would be a huge return that we would get. So that's like another one of those things about homesteading is that, you know, there's so many different aspects of it that you have to be planning ahead for. Otherwise, you're going to end up like kicking yourself. But funny enough, we found this one documentary, if I'm not mistaken, it's called Garden of Eden. It's on YouTube. And basically, it's just like this old guy. I think he's in the Pacific Northwest. I'm not sure. But um, his whole thing is just using mulch. And just like, basically, we watch this, his whole thing is like, you know, you do a layer of compost, and then you do like four to six inches of mulch. And what that's going to do is it's going to help with improving the water retention of whatever you're growing. It's going to slowly break down and put those nutrients into the soil. And it's just, it helps with weeds too, because I'm sure that's not a problem you have, but anyone else with the garden knows how much of a labor weeding is. But yeah, it's, it's funny because we watch that and then just a friend that I have out here was like, oh yeah, you know, like I cut down a tree and, you know, they shipped it on my property. And if you ever need wood chips, like help yourself. So, you know, all of our beds and especially the stuff we have in ground, we've just been slowly like adding more and more wood chips to it. Honestly, the goal would be to have almost the entire garden area that we have be almost like you know, obviously a a layer of compost and then like that four to six inches of wood chips, because again, thinking ahead, like, yeah, it's going to be wood chips now, but it's slowly going to break down. It's slowly going to get more and more nutritious. And all the while, everything that you grow is just going to be better and better. Have you heard Adam Bergstrom's perspective on compost? Because he's pretty against it. And he introduced me to Gary Matsuoka. 
the so sand the guy yeah the gary's best gardening i think he's mm-hmm. in southern california and he has really good videos like he'll post one on two hours on growing avocados or growing tomatoes but he's all about the sandy loam that's why adam's about it adam likes his work and sandy loam is pretty much sand and clay i believe Mm -hmm. and unfortunately i couldn't source that when my dome was put up mid-december last year but for my uh, next one i definitely want to that's one thing that i want to emphasize because I noticed that the beds where I put a lot of compost in, they mm. didn't do as good. And more importantly, on the compost, I believe that's where my aphid problem came from. So this infestation, which I've just been battling ever since going on seven months of battling this these demon spawn. <laughs> and I put in like mantis eggs and those are hatching and they're already starting to get pretty big. But I tried everything from assassin bugs, like minute Pirate bugs are called all the different. Uh, I've been using this website, Arbico Organics, and they sell basically aphid predators where you can hatch. A green lacewing was the other one I was starting to think of. I hatched like these three predators, fourth one's a praying mantis, and still I still see them in there. So mm. I am kind of almost on the anti compost train. I mean, maybe it was just the one that I bought. I didn't buy like biodynamic compost, or I didn't ideally make it myself. I was kind of in a rush. You know, I bought it bagged mid December, Hmm. hauled in bags, which is not ideal. It's definitely more expensive than using a, you know, dump truck and just bringing in bulk substrate. But yeah, I don't know. It's just, I want to bring that up because there's so many different perspectives on gardening. Like some people say we don't need compost at all. You know, I think Adams said it's just, it's supposed to be on top not in the soil when you think of things decomposing it's just the top layer um my tomatoes though are thriving in it one bed i didn't experiment 100 percent compost and they're almost as tall as the dome in like two weeks oh, awesome. <laughs> so yeah, you can that, grow tomatoes in straight compost i i think that's really going to depend on the source and everything and like yeah obviously it would be nice to be able to like you know make it yourself and like quality control with obviously like you know quality organic produce and you know your own eggshells and stuff like that but you know i remember the first time we got like a dump truck of dirt like just the amount of plastic that i had to sift through to like you know be comfortable with using it was obscene but yeah i I think definitely keeping it on top and like you know it's really just you need layers that are going to be working for you and i think like you know at least me i mean Alba's more of the gardener than I am, so I'm sure she knows more. But, you know, we have really dry, clay soil. Like, I remember we were digging the hole for one of our peach trees. And as we were digging it, I was just, like, getting, like, these perfect, like, cuts of clay stuck to the shovel. And I eventually just, like, I I told her, like, we could start, like, a pottery studio here and just use, like, clay from the backyard. There's that much. But... As long as you're like mixing in something to just make the soil like adding a little bit of nutrition, letting it breathe better, keeping moisture in there, then I think that's the power move. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a fun, uh, it's a fun world. I mean, my approach to it, because I, I think with whether it's health or gardening or anything, when people people tend to be stuck in the paralysis step when they're researching online and my approach and i think i'm known by this is just to dive in head first and make mistakes and and learn by you know trial and error and that's what i did with gardening you know i I took some advice from my smart friends that you know know little little tricks but for the most part i'm just learning by failure and i think that's a great way to learn i mean yeah maybe it'll take me two or three years to get a system down, but I'd rather learn it on my own instead of, you know, spending 28, you know, 30 hours a week researching and trying to like dial everything in. Uh, I'd rather just learn through hands-on experience. I think that's- Yeah, and ultimately that'll make the experience even more rewarding when you get to actually like, you know, reap the fruits of your labor. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Have you experimented with electroculture at all? So I had, I have so much- 
so many random things laying around here and i have like these copper pipes that are filled mm -hmm. with powdered shungite okay and they were just sitting on my dresser uh you know almost just like an altar thing or something i just didn't know where to put them so i just put them in my bedroom with my dresser and eventually i just shoved them in my garden beds a few weeks ago and i don't know if it's making a difference I mean, I don't know if that classifies as electroculture. I mean, it's definitely like a magnetic antenna that I put in there. Yeah, exactly. Like randomly. That like actually this. sounds very similar to an earth pipe, which is like orgone related stuff. But electroculture, actually, Justin on Extreme Health Radio has a really great episode about electroculture. I forget the name of the guest, but it's essentially just, you know, having a pole, a stick, whatever wrapped with cup copper wire that is stuck in the bed the copper wire has a contact into the ground and then just like some kind of like point on top where there's multiple connections coming off of it and basically that's just like as woo woo as it sounds like gathering atmospheric energy and putting it directly into the soil i have a few that i have not yet stuck in the ground but last year we had I had one in a uh, fig tree plant bowl pot that we inherited and that thing was kicking out figs all summer and it did not look great like i it literally was putting out more fruit than it had leaves on it so that's my little like testament to it but it, it's also one of those things where like ultimately i don't think it would work so much in the dome because the whole thing you're trying for that is to have like you want it to be as high as possible. I think the one that I was using was maybe like four feet max, but the taller, the better. And, you know, it needs to be like kind of out in the open, but it's one of those small things that like, yeah, it takes maybe like an hour to set up, but if it's an hour to set up and it, you know, the, some of the claims are like, it's going to like double or triple your production. I think that's going to be worth it. Wow. I wonder if, and I don't know how many, you know, people are going to, grow in domes but i wonder if just the shape is enough to have have like a that effect uh, on on fruit production and size because i've grown tobacco inside of a pyramid before and it was shaped as an anubian pyramid style so it was the steeper uh -huh. pyramid and it was outside in the sun and, and those things grew just it, it was amazing it was the only time I had success growing tobacco and I made like a little paste called Ambil that I just found on some Reddit forum or something. <laughs> and I mixed it with, you know, I kind of cooked it down on the stove, the tobacco leaves. I didn't even like fully cure it. I just harvested them, did like a lemon extraction, strained it, mixed it with cacao, shilajit, honey. And that definitely got me and my friend David pretty buzzed. He said he felt like he meditated. And ever since then, I, I've just been thinking about growing stuff in different shapes because normally you think about it, it's either outside in the open, which maybe is ideal or, you know, in like a hoop house or, mm. but it's rarely Squares inside of a pyramid or, or a dome. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, no, that's interesting because like, you know, if you think about like, you know, how like structured water is generated in nature it's always water running over like rocks there's no like 90 degree angles it's like that constant like flow of motion and whatnot so yeah no that would definitely be interesting to see if it has any sort of effect but the the dome is it wood and plastic or it's wood and polycarbonate yeah so the panels okay, are so polycarbonate mm -hmm. because it the whole premise between like the orgone generators that Wilhelm Reich is so famous for is like you have this like layering of organic and inorganic material. In his case, it was always like wool and then like steel wool. And basically that allows like more, it, it's super woo, woo but you know what it is. The orgone can get in and concentrate inside of the chamber faster than it can like escape it. So I'm curious if like, you know, you are kind of trapping at least a little bit of atmospheric energy just because you have that like combination of organic and inorganic i could see that yeah yeah that makes sense yeah i'm excited and it's gonna be 2026 while, while i will be growing plants both in a pyramid and in a dome so i'll be able to do some fun experiments and see maybe which shape has more of an effect with the same 
seed source, mm. you know, and seed the growth. So you're doing stuff. the real testing that people want to see. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Talk about uh, homesteading. I'm, I guess I'll do the reveal that in a few years I'll be living in a, inside, well, not living full time in a bunker, but I'm going to, <laughs> going to have a, <laughs> have a bunker underneath me. And it's going to be a really fun, really fun process. So there's, there's definitely levels, you know, I think some people are just happy with the log cabin, but I would like a, a dome on top of a bunker that that'll be my life in 2026. <laughs> uh, beyond powerful. <laughs> so let's see what else, what, what are you supplementing nowadays? Just kind of switching topics. So recently I've been big on both B1 and taurine, I guess, taurine, especially just because I remember coming across this one study like years ago, where if you take like split across a day, like a, a total of 15 grams of taurine, it can effectively double the amount of glycogen your liver can store. And, you know, to anybody in like the health field, like that's pretty insane. And if it, if it, even if it isn't, like a, a actual double anything that would increase that like the overall ramifications that that can have for both like health energy performance anything like that that's a pretty big deal and uh the b1 i forget the author of the oh sorry please well it's interesting with the taurine because they add that to red bull and i think monster like a lot of these energy drinks and I know a lot of people that can only do decaf coffee and they're coffee intolerant. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if taurine could help those people because the intolerance, my understanding is there's not enough glycogen stored fuel in the liver that the caffeine, you know, is trying to mobilize. Mm -hmm. And so if they megadose taurine for a little bit, that might be a, a fun experiment to see if you can tolerate caffeine again. You don't get jittery and anxious. And because I, in my understanding, those negative effects from caffeine are just because, I mean, some people have said it's kind of a, like a test for the liver health to see how much caffeine you could handle. Yeah. And taurine in and of itself, is going to be like improving liver function as a whole, apart from like, you know, the heart and like everything else it does. But the B1, I had a friend recommend Derek Lonsdale's book, Thiamine Deficiency Disease, Dysautomia and High Calorie Malnutrition. And that book is an absolute trip. Like I am devouring it. It's so enjoyable. But yeah, the, the I recently came out with a post about coffee, funny enough, affecting nutrient absorption. And, you know, the, my main inspiration was like, oh, I'm curious, like how if because I remember hearing that like don't take your b1 or specifically thiamine with coffee and i got into this rabbit hole of just tannins because tannins not only block the ability to absorb the uh, thiamine but also affect the enzyme for metabolizing it so you're kind of getting this like two-prong attack and it's funny because like you know i'm not trying to be like orthorexic with like oh you know like tannins, oxalates, like salicylates, you name them, but it it's specific with B1 because typically most people aren't getting that much in their diet. So it's one that, you know, it's no surprise that there's so much like, like there's so many diseases related to it. Like it's something like berry berry, for example, like there's so many things that can disguise itself when in reality it's just a deficiency in b1 and i think the fact that one it's hard to get in diet and two you know it's kind of tricky to actually properly absorb can really play a role in that because i remember like th there was literally a period like a week where i just started doing the b1 i was aware of the tannins and every time i wanted to take them i would google like oh is there tannins in x y and z and more often than not, there is. So I'm like, okay, like this is the one thing that I will go out of my way to make sure that like I'm maximizing the absorption of. 
And, you know, I remember coming home from work one day and I was like, okay, I'm just going to drink down some coconut water and slam these. And, you know, there's tannins in coconut water. And I'm not freaking out about the tannins so much, but I am just trying to see like, you know, what am I one of those people that has like a chronically low B1 level? Like I definitely noticed like improvements, like especially just because I started my dosage low, but now I've just been slamming one gram in a go. And I think that equates it, it actual thiamine it doesn't add up to much i think it's probably going to be around like 10 milligrams worth i'm not 100 percent sure but uh, yeah it, it's just it's one of those things that you really have to like sneak in so that's kind of just how i've been playing with it but funny enough like even nicotine can interfere with thiamine absorption but i remember the first time i took it i you know, I put a lip in and I immediately felt the nicotine. Like I was like a high schooler trying it for the first time. And I was like, okay, wow. Like maybe there is something going on here. Yeah. I love Elliot Overton's information. I think like you mentioned, Barry Berry, but yeah, there's so many conditions he's talked about. I think brain fog and mm -hmm. anxiety or depression, like a lot of like emotional mood disorders could be B1 deficiency. I'm curious the form. Are you just taking like thiamine HCL or, or have you played around with different forms? So when I'm slamming the gram in one go, it's hydrochloride, but then I'm also taking a uh, benfotiamine and I actually have some of Elliot's uh, TTFD that I'll just like, you know, try and sneak in throughout the day. But yeah, that combination of B1 and magnesium, because they're basically like the primary cofactors for energy metabolism. And it's one of those things, like I like to focus on, you know, the very base level foundational stuff, because when you're able to address that and make sure that, you know, energy is flowing properly, like everything else kind of can fall into place. Mm -hmm. Are you still, are you playing around with like any niacin, niacinamide? Yeah, I, I've been doing that. I think like 500 milligrams three times a day just to keep the fatty acid oxidation down and you know honestly like i i've that funk that i got into from just working myself to the bone was basically resolved by i think mainly just consistency with b vitamins and just focusing on like eating and not skipping meals even if i didn't like really feel like i had the time to eat and yeah apart from that like I've also been really experimenting with diet and I'm trying to keep fat below 20 grams a day while basically just slamming carbs out the wazoo. Like I think if I pulled up my chronometer, it wouldn't be anything out of the ordinary to see more than like 200 grams of sugar, just straight sugar per day. And the energy off of that is crazy. And I'm actually using that as like, I'm like trying to cut right now. And I've never been able to lose weight while also like having this level of energy. So it, it, it's kind of crazy once you like, you know, get things up and running and then just streamline them, how effective your body can actually perform. Yeah. I should probably add up the amount of fat that I'm consuming a day. I, I think the majority of it is probably with my breakfast with, you know, a good amount of butter on my, on my sourdough and hmm. heavy cream. That's probably the majority of the fat that I get in a day. And I usually just put butter on everything, but I, I could be below that 20 grams a day. Cause that's pretty much my only fat source. Yeah. Recently it's just been either coconut oil or eggs just because, you know, with 15 chickens, like I only have so many friends that I can give eggs to. So I got to do something to keep those numbers down, but uh, yeah, no, it, it, it's a really interesting experiment. I would definitely wouldn't recommend that recommended to anyone who isn't like in a good state of health or really knows what they're doing but it's something that you know it, it's just so convenient like my breakfast is literally like you know some apple juice instead of orange juice just because i cannot find like a decent like bottled orange juice in any supermarket whether it be like uncle matt's or like i think the other brands like evolution or any of those like if I have too much of it, like eventually I start getting a funk, but apple juice on the other hand, you know, I have no problem with that. So I'll just like 
dissolve two servings of gelatin, mix that into the apple juice, and then add some sugar and like the trace minerals. And I call that breakfast and immediately head to the gym and I just kill my workout no problem and you know shake after that and then whatever the wife cooks for lunch and dinner i'm fine wow yeah lately life's been kind of crazy so i've been relying on uh jerky a lot of the time so like yesterday i went on pretty much like a little three-hour hike (laughs) just scouting out a spot and hiking around in the woods and that hawaiian venison jerky from maui nui that brings me back to life if i'm just don't have time to eat. I slam two of those or three of those. That's 20 to 30 grams of protein. And I just feel amazing. And then I've actually started carrying a little honey in my uh, backpack again. So the nice. one with a little squeeze, you know, which is just, you know, sugar. It's so and- convenient. Oh, yeah. yeah. And speaking of protein, I've actually, you know, I definitely prescribe to the thought that you need at least like, a gram of protein per pound of body weight. And then I was partial to like 0.6 grams per kilo. And now honestly, like I just focus on trying to get like a hundred grams per day. And usually like, you know, anything in like the more intense, like bodybuilding fitness sphere, like they would think I was crazy for saying that, but you know, granted I haven't worked out. There's a, like maybe a three or four month period where I wasn't exercising almost at all, just because of all these projects. And I don't want to have to worry about that on top of it. But recently, like, you know, only with a hundred grams of protein, like I'm definitely recovering from my training. Like I feel great. Like I'm focusing actually on like, you know, gelatin and collagen. And then just honestly, like a casein and like milk powder. And like, I, I feel like a hundred grams is definitely like a good minimum, but if, if, you know, depending on, uh, again, depending on what the wife makes, it's probably usually like 120, 140, but it's crazy to think that like so many people are just like following something that's just been repeated and repeated again and again, like, oh, you need a gram per pound of body weight. And I remember, you know, like 10 years ago, like I would literally, oh, I, I need to go to sleep. Oh, I'm at like 180 grams. Like, oh, I'm not going to get my gains. I need to go downstairs and have like some Greek yogurt or just like ground some beef and slam that really quick. But yeah, no, it, it's it, it's one of those really eye-opening things because again, it's just parroted so much but, and to the point where I don't think anybody really wants to like experiment with it. But if you do, you can really see that like you can get away with like significantly less and that's going to put like you know, I'm not going to say like protein's toxic by any means, but at the same time, if I can replace the calories I need for, for protein with carbs, and I know carbs are protein sparing, like I, I'm kind of a happy eater doing that. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a great point that carbs are protein sparing. Def- that's definitely not talked about in the keto carnivore community. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I'm in the same, I, I kind of aim for a hundred grams of protein a day. Um, with the gelatin, you add your apple juice. Is that what what type of gelatin is that? Hydro is it hyd- hydrolyzed or? No, it, it, it's gelatin, not collagen. So it, oh, it's, okay, okay, yeah, just the straight gelatin powder. Exactly. So okay, otherwise, it like typically, if you were to just add it straight in, it would just be a clumpy, disgusting <laughs> mess. But I'll just like you know warm up a cup of water on the uh, stove and just I have like a milk frother, so I start spinning it and I slowly add it in and it dissolves perfectly and then you know just depending on how much water you use, it kind of makes it more, th- the liquid you're drinking a little bit more thick, which uh, honestly is kind of enjoyable sometimes. But uh, yeah, no, it, it's one of those easy tricks because I know so many people opt for collagen, but gelatin's just as good. And it's just, you know, granted you have to do that extra step, but I feel like, you know, it, it's nice to know. Are there benefits in your, in your opinion of gelatin versus collagen, like gelatin instead of? collagen i mean the only real difference i'd say is just that collagen is more processed so it really depends on you know how you view that but i don't feel the collagen as much as i do the gelatin i know that's like completely subjective but it funny enough this morning we're running low on gelatin so i actually use collagen and i definitely didn't like get that same degree of satiation that i do when i do my two scoops of gelatin how much coffee are you consuming Believe it or not, when I was like 
again, like burnt out doing all the, uh, the housework, the property work. I was like easily sucking down maybe like a pot or a pot and a half of coffee. And now like I, I drink like maybe half a pot. So I think like maybe five ounces a day. So, you know, I'm not sure if that's just because like, you know, I have, I, I don't want to say I was even really using coffee so much for energy. I really do just like the taste, but I just definitely don't feel like that subconscious pull to it nearly as much as I was before. And that's just, you know, th th that's one of the first things I realized when I switched over to like significantly lower fat, and just like higher carbs. Like I, I kept telling my wife, like, look, I have coffee for tomorrow. This does not happen. Yeah. One of the, the listeners actually asked best, what's the best decaf coffee that you recommend? Cause their I body can't no idea because <laughs> they <laughs> can't handle the regular. I would go back to the taurine experiment and it doesn't have yeah, to be absolutely. 15 grams a day, mm -hmm. but maybe try five a day. Right. And just experiment with that for a while and see, I would imagine it would change someone's tolerance. Yeah. Like three to five grams, like a little bit prior to actually taking the coffee. I think that would just like, if anything, that basically is like a liver health tonic because that's just going to help it flush and just, you know, stay on top of performance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Before the show, John was joking about the coffee enemas, how they bring those up in every show. And uh, the only, and we did have a question about it, but I'll just say that I think Tudka might be a replacement. And that's kind of what we were saying. Mm. What, what, what what was your thought on Tudka? You were saying several grams. Of it, it, it's just, it's super powerful. Like dosages above five grams are like incredibly liver protective. Like that's something that I got from like, you know, higher level bodybuilders who are obviously abusing gear, but mm -hmm. you know, that on top of other lifestyle choices, that's something that's able to like, you know, keep liver enzymes down, and just like allow for a longer career. And that's something that I've seen a, at least a few like, pro level bodybuilders mention and like obviously you know you can only extrapolate so much but if it's working for somebody that has a liver that's you know handling so many different compounds then you know that's a sign to its efficacy i think yeah yeah i definitely i think it's it's really popular right now in the health community like alternative methods of delivery and whether it's iv into the vein which usually the forms of nutrients that are used in these biohacking, like IV clinics, they're very cheap. Like mm -hmm. going back to the B1 thing, the, for, the, the quality of the, of the thiamine that you're going to get in a supplement is probably going to be way higher than like a Myers cocktail or like IV with B complex. It's just really, really like the cheapest, like the cheapest forms of of the vitamins not the active forms i mean it's dirt cheap for them to make these iv bags mm -hmm. but my point is that rectal you know methylene blue or glutathione or melatonin i don't think we need to go that route and even just the liposomal trends i've been trying to shine light on this the last couple of years that you don't need liposomal vitamin C, just take plain ascorbic acid powder. You don't need liposomal melatonin, just take plain melatonin powder. It's cheaper, it's more effective, your gut bacteria love it. So there's a lot of like re-education that needs to happen in the natural health community because I think people are obsessed with enhancing absorption and they don't understand that that's been a large like marketing ploy by these companies. Yeah, it's crazy. Just like, you know, the marketing for like this almost stuff and just like all the like, uh, I don't know. It, it's funny because like, you know, they go such intense routes, obviously talking about like, you know, basically boofing supplements. But, you know, I, I feel like there's some serious neglect for simply like, you know, transdermal absorption even. And, you know, granted, you're not going to be getting as much, but your skin's going to like filter out like anything it doesn't want. And then whatever it gets in your bloodstream is going to be like, you know, the heavy hitting stuff. And, you know, I think it's one of those things where it's definitely a topic of debate, but even like using your belly button for transdermal application. I think I remember seeing something, I think Georgie posted this actually, that belly button administration of like certain supplements can actually be as effective as like an IV in regards to absorption. 
So that was something that I tried in the past. And like, depending on what I was using, I definitely noticed a more intense effect. Yeah, I'm working on getting a podcast on transdermal glutathione because I've been playing around with a, a patented form of it. And I definitely feel it. I've never felt any glutathione supplement in the past. And there's this cool like trinity with vitamin E, vitamin C and glutathione where they all like support each other. And especially the last three years, you know, with infection going around, I've definitely been upping my, my dose of, of antioxidants and feel way better just with the, the inflammation of, of that infection that we won't name. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, the antioxidants, that was something that like, you've put me on to like two big things in that regard. And that was first vitamin C and then second melatonin. Like I was always interested in melatonin, mm -hmm. but I didn't know that like, you know, you could comfortably do such high dosages. And that's something that I've been doing a lot of recently, just a combination of like basically EC and then a really high dose of melatonin before bed. And I swear, like, I, I don't wake up feeling as refreshed as I do after that, like ever in my life. Like I can't, remember a sleep where I was like, oh my gosh, like that was exactly what I needed. Like I, my body feels rested. Like my soreness is so much lower than it would be otherwise. And it's just, I don't know. It, it's funny because I feel like a lot of people when it comes to just like health as a whole, like antioxidants are just like one of those words that like get thrown around so much. But when you're using them effectively, especially something like melatonin, just because it's so small and it can get into so many different places, like it's insane the benefits you can feel from that. Yeah. Yeah. One of the questions I get the most about that are, you know, am I going to wake up the next day if I take more than you know, 50 milligrams. And, you know, I took this amount and I feel, I felt groggy when I woke up, what was that about? Or I felt, you know, I just felt bad. I felt off. And that's a really interesting rabbit hole because it's related to mitochondrial health. And I think what's happening with those people is they're, they have mitochondrial dysfunction. I think we all do to some degree, like on a spectrum, but when they take a large amount more than they've, than they've ever taken before, it's, it's really working on their mitochondria. And if, and if they're super dysfunctional, maybe they need more to actually push over that edge to actually get, you know, get the full regenerative effect on their mitochondria. But that's, that's just an interesting area to explore because it's, there's that misconception of like, Oh, I felt bad because I took too much. And it's like, no, you probably didn't take enough which is so counterintuitive. Yeah, it's funny because I actually have a client right now that um, he was taking like, you know, just some awful, like genuine Walmart melatonin that was five milligrams. And he's like, oh, I can't do it every night because I wake up groggy and I actually recommended him yours. And he said like, dude, the sleep I get off of this is crazy. And he's only taking 50 milligrams. And I know both of us have experimented with like higher doses. I think the most I've ever taken just literally just to see if I could, I think was either 500 or 600 milligrams and I woke up fine. So it really is just a sign that like, you know, sometimes things have to get worse before they get better, especially when it again is something that's at such a like ground level for energy production. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think the power too is uh, like today it's, I haven't, the sun has not been out. It's been overcast and, you know, I still, you know, got out and walked around and stuff, but for the most part, you know, I don't think my brain got a strong signal that it's daytime, which is why I have a, a blue light on here. But I think on a normal day where the sun's out, I usually go outside with my coffee for a few minutes, walk around. That's a really powerful combination because I think people in the health community think it's either that, you know, sun gazing, grounding, you know, blue blockers and getting the light in the day and not supplementing melatonin. And I just say, why not both? You know, why not give your, you know, SCN and your brain that signal, you know, give your skin the signal, you know, limit artificial light at night and supplement melatonin. I think that's a great way to, to really sync the body up. Cause I, I mean, in, in Russell Ryder's book on melatonin, he talks about melatonin fixing jet lag. So it's a really strong, like circadian 
signal, obviously, but the supplemental gets so much hate. But if mm. it's used in conjunction with everything, I think it's just an awesome addition yeah, to absolutely. The, the foundation. And I, I think this is going to go against a lot of, you know, like the alternative, alternative health sphere. But I, you know, blue light does have a purpose. And this is something that I've realized now that I'm doing more like work in my office with two monitors in front of me. Like I was using Flux, which is one of those programs that, you know, makes your screen like tinted, like orangish red. And it, it's funny because like I would have that going all day and I would have like this cheapo red light that I bought ages ago on behind me. And I just could not ever like get to like the level of focus that I expect my, myself. And I just on a whim, like turned it off one day and it, it, it's, you know, like, yeah, blue light can damage you, but it is stimulating. And I think, especially during the day, you need it because ever since I've done that, like, you know, I have that focus that I expect of myself and I'm able to like, you know, concentrate and do work. And like, you know, God forbid there's red light going into my retina or excuse me, blue light going into my retinas. But at the same time, like, you know, it's daytime. Like, yeah, maybe I should be doing my work on a laptop outside in the sun, but you know, for what I've got, like it's, it's doing something. Yeah. I think there's, there's just a computer that came out or it's almost like an iPad type thing. I don't know if you've seen, I've been getting ads for it now. Probably everyone will. <laughs> it's supposed to be like no blue light kind okay. of, kind of thing, which is all right. But yeah, I definitely agree with what you're saying. And I've done that experiment and kind of diving deeper into that. You know, my big thing is lipofuscin and that age pigment, that kind of glycated combination of oxidized lipids and damaged proteins, even damaged mitochondria that binds together with these, with metals, aluminum, iron, copper. A lot of the lipofuscin accumulates in the retina. And our retina is one of the highest places of oxidative stress because largely just just light, the light exposure. And vitamin E, vitamin C, I believe even melatonin, protect the eye from that oxidative stress. And I remember being in the health field the last 14 years, going to conferences, seeing marketed, marketed products. And I think it was like four years ago, it was like lutein, zeaxanthin, astaxanthin, fish oil, or omega threes, mm -hmm. which is one of the worst things for your eyes, if you're ex if you're doing like your experiment, like office work, you know, just a lot of blue light. Mm -hmm. I, I think if you're supplementing that, long story short, if you're supplementing C E melatonin, if you want to add transdermal glutathione, but even just those first three, you do not have to worry about blue light. And I would say also don't supplement krill or fish oil. You know, I guess we could talk about cod liver oil because that's always a a a topic that people are curious about with the the pufas or omega threes in there, but I just love your point because yeah, it's it's so demonized, especially from screens. But on days like today, I need it to feel alert. Yeah, <laughs> you know? no, absolutely. It's like... And it, it, it's funny because again, like we're going back to antioxidants and how much of a role that they have in our body, and just like you know, basically supporting us against all those different forms of oxidative damage that we get from our environment. So. You know, I just thought of this now, but it's funny because like, you know, you get into health and like antioxidants are number one, you learn a little bit more and it's like, eh, okay, antioxidants are just there. And then, you know, you continue learning more and it's like, okay, like antioxidants are no joke. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And just even all the other effects that they have, like, I think it's not well known that vitamin C and E protect us from excessive UV light from photo aging, from sun damage. And they also protect us from radiation, from Wi-Fi and, you know, non-native EMF or man-made electromagnetic radiation, EMR. And just those points alone, I mean, because those are big concerns in people. I know Brian Johnson <laughs> talks a lot about sunscreen on, uh, you know, Twitter slash X. I always like to read the battles and people get so triggered. <laughs> <laughs> when you bring up protecting from sun and limiting exposure, I think that's a really trendy thing right now in the health community, you know, is 
is sun worshiping. And I think absolutely, yeah, get sun in the summer. But where you and I live, mm. we're in the far north. I don't have sun up here for six months out of the year, at least, sometimes mm. more. And I feel awesome. I actually feel happier in the middle of winter, I would say, than I do middle of summer personally. And I don't know how much of that is genetics or just that I love snow and looking outside and just seeing all this white and time to take my snowmobile out and rip <laughs> around. And <laughs> Yeah, the C and the EMFs, I know that's something that you've talked about a lot, but it, that was probably one of the biggest changes to like my own well-being because I remember I asked you about like how you were doing your dosages for C and like your regimen for that when you just started getting into it. And, you know, I was basically following suit, which is like a gram every hour, as many hours of the day as I can comfortably. And where I work at one of my jobs, I basically I'm sitting right next to a router and there's also another router in the house. And the first few months that I was working there, like I, I never would consider myself to be one of those EMF sensitive people, but I could definitely just like feel the oppression that it generated. But after doing like the C like very diligently for I think like two or three weeks, like I remember stepping in and just like, oh, like it, it's gone. Like I don't notice that. So, you know, it, it's one of those things, just like changing your redox balance and just being able to actually like deal at a cellular level with, you know, all these things in our environment that are trying, not necessarily trying, but just can affect our health. Like, you know, you got to do what you can to just be prepared against that. Yeah, I, I've been playing around with the night vision goggles, like the real deal <laughs> and looking up at the night sky and up here, we can see a lot of, you know, there's a lot of stars, but when the night vision, I mean, thousands, just tons. And, uh, you know, I'm always looking for UFOs and things doing 90 degree turns and <laughs> different <laughs> things. But every time I look up, I'll see, you know, just a slow Starlink satellite going mm -hmm. across the sky. I think that's a big concern with people right now, I mean, especially in the ancestral health community or the natural health community that, you know, we're on a microwave planet and Elon just keeps launching these satellites up there. And there's, you know, you've seen a, there's, there's animations where you could see how many are already circling the earth mm -hmm. and there's thousands. And I think the answer is C and E and, and, antioxidants ce melatonin you know those big three i would say and i've had the same experience where i super sensitive and now it's like i feel like i'm just getting stronger and more resilient and for people they might be wondering about like timing and dosage <clears throat> what what's kind of your strategy with with taking those two honestly with the e i'll try and get Goodness gracious, I forget how much the doses are per serving size, but I'll try and get like three servings total, like breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And then in between that, like I'm not as strict as I was in the past, but when I was really hammering this, it was just one gram basically every hour. And that's obviously super tedious. That's also another point where like, you know, I was trying to do it with the powder for a bit, but the capsules are just so much more convenient. And, you know, just staying on top of that and you know, it, it, it's, we can hope the world changes as much as we want. And at the end of the day, like, yeah, you can improve your environment to mitigate like the exposure that you're getting. But at the same time, what happens when you leave, you know, yeah. what happens when you go to the mall or to a store, or you're just driving and you pass by like a 5g tower. Like, why would you focus on you know, basically creating a safe space when you can turn your body into the safe space just by, you know, effectively saturating yourself with ascorbic acid e and, you know, melatonin to top it off. Yeah. Yeah. I see you know, every, every day on social media, literally there's not a day that goes by. I don't see an anti Tesla post or an anti EV post, you know, right now everyone's making fun of the cyber truck and people that drive that or whatever, whatever. And, point with bringing that up is there's so many people that are sensitive that say I get sick when I drive in a Tesla. I'm not even talking about like charging, like fast charging and sitting in the, the back left seat, which is where the charging port is. I'm talking about just driving in the car. 
Hmm. And to me, those people are telling me that they're severely deficient in tissue levels of ascorbate. Because with vitamin C, it's not just ascorbic acid. You have DHA, dehydroascorbic acid, and then you have these basically different forms of vitamin C in the tissue. But you can measure your tissue levels with the Oligo scan, which shines in light and can see basically the, the vitamin C that's in the tissue of your hand and get, you know, a way better picture than like a vitamin C blood test because the vitamin C isn't in the blood in high amounts, just like magnesium isn't in the blood in high amounts. Magnesium's in, in, in the mitochondria. It's not in the red blood cells. Red blood cells don't have mitochondria. So kind of going all over the place here, but I'm not a fan of blood tests in general. I think people are misinformed by those generally and think, oh, I'm good on this nutrient, you know, where hmm. they could be good in the plasma or the serum, but it's not in the tissue. Same thing with vitamin E. Vitamin E will actually come up on that Oligo scan too. So I think tests like that are the future, especially non-invasive using light, looking actually, I mean, it's kind of like doing a biopsy non-invasively it's pretty cool but yeah i think tesla sensitive people you know electric car haters generally they're probably deficient in vitamin c and vitamin e and and maybe against supplementation and they're relying on green juices i mean i literally saw a reel on that on instagram she said my tesla car gave me this disease and the video starts with her holding a big green juice <laughs> it's like <laughs> Okay. And, I, and I'm not talking about oxalates and that kind of argument, but I'm talking about, I mean, the only good thing in that green juice, is my opinion, are enzymes. That was my experience with raw veganism. That's all you're getting. A uh, cleaner source would be just supplementing straight hill enzymes, which is what I do now. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> like digestive enzymes, systemic enzymes, you know, hmm. but I'm just saying generally if someone's putting a green juice in a reel, they're probably not hip, in my opinion, to <laughs> strategic supplementation. So anyway, there's a lot there, but I'll have a whole show probably on electric cars versus diesel, because I feel like that's, it's actually a part of health. I mean, we're talking about air quality. We're talking about EMFs. Traditional cars pretty much have similar EMFs now to EVs with all the electronics in their hotspot and Bluetooth and Wi-Fi. Yeah, it's crazy that a car can give you Wi-Fi now. But <laughs> you know, at, at least for me, the my problem with electric cars is, you know, more with just the inception of cars as, as a whole, because you know, cars could be run on ethanol, but the government and every oil business doesn't want you being able to produce your own fuel in your backyard. So, you know, that's my main gripe with it. Yeah, it's going to be like cleaner for the environment and everything. But and obviously in someone with a situation like you where you can literally charge it from the sun like that, that's basically as close as you can get to, you know, just having a still for your like fuel in your backyard today. Yeah. And I think that's that's my main argument is why hate on something if someone's able to power it from the house. And I, obviously, I think it's a control thing. I was actually texting my friend Ken yesterday. It's a friend that I have up here about sodium, sodium batteries. It's like sodium ion batteries or something like mm. that instead of lithium. And those are way better than lithium, way more sustainable, just more efficient, you know, energy dense. Yeah, I, I think we're, we're in a control system and things like solar panels, wind, hydroelectric. I mean, these have been around for a hundred years, <laughs> like a very, very long time. Mm. And uh, you know, we've had water cars that can run on salt water from the ocean. You know, there's been a lot of alternatives. I would prefer like nuclear power. I yeah, think you, you know, like nuclear is just, just gets such a bad rap, but people don't understand like how much energy is produced with so little in such a small area. Like, I don't think there's any nuclear plants in New Jersey. At least I've never seen one, but moving to Pennsylvania, like I've seen a few and like every time, like I, I feel like, you know, a kid like seeing his favorite animal in the car i was just like oh my gosh like that's that's beautiful like i i don't care about chernobyl that's like its own thing but like nuclear literally it's like the most effective way of powering like everything yeah yeah absolutely my my brain always just goes back to if 
I couldn't get X, Y, Z, gas, diesel, propane. What would I do? How long could I live? How many years would I be okay? You know, it's just the thought experiments that I like going through Hmm. and not taking it to like a doomsday level. But for me, it's just very empowering to, to think about that stuff because I could start moving in a direction of setting things up to where I'd be okay if those three sources went away. Like one thing I want to get into in the next couple of years is generating my own natural gas, which all you need, and I'll probably have a room in the bunker for this, is basically a temperature controlled, you know, above freezing. It's almost like a compost bin type thing, but think of like a, almost like a soft shell hyperbaric kind of thing. Um, And you could put in food scraps or manure and it's connected to a little box and you could actually cook with it. You know, you could actually generate some, some gas that you could burn with it. And uh, I think that's great, you know, just having that option. So, yeah, I I mean like anything to like push the reliance on, you know, the oil industry, like further away from yourself, I think it's going to be a benefit because it's crazy how much of a rope they have around people. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Let's see. Someone said, talk about your octopus. (laughs) (laughs) Any thoughts on the octopus? (laughs) Uh, I fully support the octopus. How many crabs a day is he up to? (laughs) It's like one one or two shore crabs a day, but it's so expensive to feed them live. So I tried feeding him thawed shrimp and he's so spoiled. He literally pushed it away. (laughs) (laughs) He like grabbed it and then just threw it. But uh, yeah, they're fascinating creatures. The next one I, I'm going to get after they have a short lifespan of about three years, two to three years. So after he passes, I want to get into cuttlefish because I've never, never had success with cuttlefish. But yeah, aquariums for me are, are just kind of a cool. I think it's better than a TV. I replaced my TV with a 200 gallon saltwater aquarium. And I think it's better to look at. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> about cortisol and how to lower it. Thoughts on that? Wow, that's so funny because I actually literally yesterday got a bottle of 7-Keto DHEA and that's super antagonistic to cortisol, like to the point where it's recommended not taking it in the morning. Otherwise, it would actually blunt that like natural cortisol rise. But uh, yeah, it's, you know, it's only been two days on it. I'm only doing 50 milligrams and it definitely has like a very interesting like calm but energized feeling to it i have noticed like a little bit of anxiety immediately after taking it funny enough it's like one of those supplements that like i take and like within five minutes i can feel a difference in myself but you know it's also like a mild thermogenic just because of like all the different pathways it's acting on and you know i'm seeing if that's going to just help with like expediting fat loss and you know turn the cut into something that won't be like as long so I can just switch over to maintenance and start having fun. So it's different from just straight DHEA, right? Comes from DHEA? Yeah, it's a metabolite. Okay. But one of the main things is that it can't be converted into estrogen like DHEA. At the same time, it also can't be converted into, what is it, androsterone. So it can't be anabolic, but you know, I I would, I, I think that's like a worthy sacrifice. Hmm. Did you ever experiment with like, like Cialis or that? A few times. I'm not sure if it was Cialis or Viagra, but I was taking that prior to the gym just to like see like the full extent of that, like blood vessel dilation effect. And it's certainly noticeable, but you know, I, I, I think I got it off of like all day chemist or something. So it came from India and I went through like one blister pack and I was just like, eh, you know, it's nothing that like, no, I'm going to come back and like, you know, like, it's not like something that's, it didn't work its way into my usual stack. Yeah. It was a fun experiment though. Like the pumps are like skin splitting. I'm always just trying to be aware of prostate cancer. Cause from what I've read, that's like an inevitable thing for every man. Once they reach a certain age, it's what they say. Mm-hmm. And so over the years, I've just been accumulating supplements, which Cialis is one to Dalafil that helps prevent not only prostate, but different cancers. So that's very helpful. But yeah, one one thing you got me onto was 
can't remember the nootropics website but we chatted about that i think it was earlier this year or late last yeah, year yeah yeah and i've still been enjoying fenibut every so often and it, it's weird because it's it's never been addictive for me you know you'll you'll watch these youtube videos where they say fenibut messed me up mm-hmm. and generally as someone that took it every day like yeah, exactly. Several months in a row. And there was actually a problem where there was a few supplement companies that were including it in like a sleep type of like powder stack thing without obviously advertising the dangers of it. So people were just, you know, like basically going through withdrawals and being like, oh, like what's going on? But uh, yeah, it, it's one of those things where I, I think people that were abusing stuff like Xanax turn to to kind of wean off but then they end up just getting addicted to it too but seriously if you're just going to use it like two at max maybe three times a week i think it has such a potent like such a intense and anti-zylotic effect that you know if you use it strategically for like i don't know like a job interview a stressful day that you know is going to happen it's something that's just going to keep you from basically like you know, blowing a gasket. So it's the, I, I think on the, the website's new tropics depot, if I'm not mistaken, mm-hmm. but on the description for it, they talk about how it was included in all the, like the first aid kits for like Russian cosmonauts, mm-hmm. because, you know, obviously I think it, a space sh- sh- shuttle would be the last place you want to have a panic attack. So it, it's basically just, it's something that can really prevent you from basically tipping over the edge with anxiety. You just triggered all the flat earthers that listen to. <laughs> <laughs> hey man, they yeah. can go. They can go in the shuttle. That doesn't mean it has to go anywhere. All right, that's all I'm going to say. <laughs> For those that aren't familiar, uh, Fenibut is related to GABA. Like it's pretty much it's pretty similar molecule that yeah helps like. John was saying helps with anxiety and insomnia and pretty much just chills you out like mm-hmm. like a GABA supplement would, GABA agonist. I wouldn't say it was like, at least in my experience, I w- wouldn't call it like sedative though. It really mm-hmm. is just specifically like, you know, it, it brings calm to you. And it's really interesting mm-hmm. to see that like, you know, behind the iron curtain they were basically working on like synthetic adaptogens and like this is one of the ones that they came up with and it's just like you know it, it's i don't know i i just the whole idea of synthetic ind- adaptogens i think that's such an interesting like pursuit because being able to like you know granted you have your plant you have your root you have that one compound in it but if you're able to like specifically tailor a compound to specific receptors in the body that create like a really narrow but desired effect i think like the potential of that is like limitless yeah yeah i think transcriptions i've had dr scott share on the show a few times they just came out with one that was an extract from cordyceps i think it's a uh, cordycepin okay troimmune oh yeah i guess it is out it's on their website but that's i felt a chilled out effect from that from the cordycepin and kind of, a, you know, Mr. Megados experimenting with taking a lot of it. And I think their doctor did, you know, I heard through the grapevine that he he's Megadosed it too. And it's it's generally safe compounds just from cordyceps, but mm. kind of on that same vein of, you know, extract of an adaptogen where you're just taking that active component. But yeah, I highly recommend Fenibut just to keep in your first aid cabinet, uh, like kind of a mental emotional first aid or like preventative or yeah no absolutely just because like you know if you have like you know like we've talked about like oh like I, i'm gonna have like a shit show of a day like why stress myself out take it like if you're having like you know any sort of like rumination you're just like getting in your own head you're just basically turning yourself into an anxious mess and like you know you had a meal you did everything else that you usually do to calm yourself down and if it's not working it's it's one of those things where you know i've kind of just accepted like you know yeah it's not natural yeah it's not like the perfect like you know like what i want to see in a formulation in regards to excipients and whatnot Mm -hmm. but at the same time like why suffer you know yeah yeah i think people that you know family holidays where it could be more stressful great application 
first date, great application, long drive, talking like five, six hour drive, great application. There's Mm -hmm. so many ways to use it. It's awesome. I know on the the website, they have dihydromyricetin. And I know you're kind of similar beliefs with alcohol, kind of what is about alcohol, ethanol consumption. And I played around with so many mitigations. And that's one that I think I learned through Michaela Peterson, because she came out with a supplement. You know, they make like these pre-party supplements that Uh I think Himalaya brand had like Party Smart that I heard about like a decade ago. People still take. I never really felt that one from Himalayas a supplement company. But this stack that I've done with dihydromyricetin combined with the Z-biotic GMO bacteria that you take this little shot. They're expensive. It's like five, eight dollars a shot, something like that. But you take it a couple of minutes before you drink, transient bacteria stays in you for 24 hours. I think that Z-biotic actually has benefits beyond alcohol consumption too. If you consider the work of Sean Bean that I've had on my show, it's like a, a functional medicine practitioner that talks about how we're all walking, talking, autistic alcoholics for the most part with, <laughs> with like all the chemical reactions that are occurring from the mold that are pumping out different compounds in our body and his thing is we're all autistic alcoholics, which is kind of an interesting thing <laughs> to consider. But yeah, I was just curious if you'd, if you'd experimented with that one. That Honestly, is- no. And the only times I really drink are, there was a very, I think it was at least like four months straight where like my Sunday ritual would literally just be a bath with a drink and a book. And that was like, that, that just melted the way or the, it melted away the stress of the week and prepared me for the next week, like plain and simple. And the only other time is like whenever I'm doing something tedious on the computer and it's nothing like super brain intensive, but it's just something that involves like a lot of, you know, moving stuff around. And it's just, you know, like it's nothing that, it's not something that I do every day by any means. I think if I did, I think my Slavic DNA would like override my conscious will and just have me start pounding bottles. But yeah, it, it, I, it gets such a bad rap. It doesn't do anything good for you, but it is just such like a... I would refute that. So, <laughs> <laughs> like, ultimately, I think the benefit just comes from the fact that, like, you know, you might be more sociable and, you know, you're the able to... Ah, oh, true. How can I forget? <laughs> you need your te- tequila and pineapple and burn that <laughs> stuff out. But, yeah, it's one of those things where, like, you know, I, I guess this could be settled about a lot of drugs where the benefit just comes from like the experience that's created because of it. Yeah. And the dosage, I think, too. I mean, I have a million tinctures here and they're all, for the most part, alcohol extracts, mm. uh, you know, grape alcohol, whatever. And that's been used for a long time. But yeah, I, if I do a shot of tequila, it's one ounce. I do not crave more when I do that. Because I know how two shots would make me feel and it's not good, even with all mm. the mitigation stuff. So I think it's that self-awareness too. And and yeah, probably not daily. It's just funny listening to like Ben Greenfield, who he promotes at least what he does, a drink every night, like red wine, I think, and dry farm wines or whatever. And then you have people like Dan Amen that you know, brain scans showing what alcohol does to the brain. It's a neurotoxin. And I think Huberman talks about that as well. I think it's a gray area and it's definitely something to experiment with, but there's definitely that addictive component. Obviously alcoholics exist, but Mm. I think it comes down to why you're using any substance, whether it's kava, kratom, alcohol. I think the tobacco addiction thing is funny to me because I've gone months without it. And it's just, I did my body just asked for a break and I stopped craving it. It's never been like addictive to me. Yeah, no, I, I've had very similar experiences when it comes to nicotine. Like there'll be periods where I'm definitely more frequently using it, but then usually whenever like the impetus for that craving is finished, whether it be like a project work, it's just overall life stress. It's just like, okay, like, you know, you don't, you're, you're fine. You know, you're, I, I don't get cravings. And I think, you know, I, I know you pointed this out on a recent show, but just it, it's 
the nicotine's almost only so much of that addictive component. It really is just being able to kind of on demand take the stress off. And I think once the stress is gone, like, you know, the craving can go. And I mean, that's something that has been documented, for example, in Vietnam, like all the soldiers that were using heroin in Vietnam, they came back to the States and, you know, they had no desire to do it because they were gone from the stress. They were gone from like, you know, the environment that they associate with it. Mm -hmm. Was it you that sent me, <laughs> it's kind of getting out there, but this is a coffee chat. Was it you that sent me a little video of the Vietnam helicopter pilots that were using the red night vision red night vision yeah yeah yeah, 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 yeah. That, that that's a wild video if anybody's interested in that i'm pretty sure if you just google like vietnam red night vision they'll it, it'll come up it was a, just some like animated youtube video where the guy like talks about the story and has some like silly pictures to follow along with but yeah that that was Basically, before night vision was green, like everybody is used to either green or like black and white, depending on what system you're using, they tested red and the red spectrum was like having people see like basically demons and shit and freaking them out and just like, yeah, it, it's a crazy story. I'm not sure about like how valid it is. It's, it's definitely a fun little listen though. So I recommend yeah. it. It seems valid to me. I mean, I, I believe the the way that psychedelics work are they open up, you know, they, they remove the veils where people could perceive into other layers of reality, other dimensions, whatever mm -hmm. you want to call it. And I think that's possible to do with technology, just like it's possible to use biohacking technology, you know, to influence the brain chemistry. I mean, well, let me let me let me rephrase that. So I I, I think it was real, uh, and I mean, obviously they were doing th those pilots were on drugs, right? They were kind of combining. I mean, I think the, they had to be. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it was kind of a hellish situation. But anyway, I'll put the link below where people could just watch it because uh, it it makes sense to me. I mean, yeah, especially when you consider the fact that, like, you know, light has this entire spectrum where we're only seeing like a sliver yep, of it exactly. so you know it, it's not the craziest thing to believe i think you can honestly even like loop in bigfoot depending <laughs> on whether or not you're in the field where you think it's like a flesh and blood creature or you think it's like some you know extra dimensional entity forest guardian woo woo, whatever and um yeah, no, it's just it, there's so much more going on around us that we're just not able to sense. And something that like I like whenever I start thinking about this, I just end up like lost in thought for like hours. But the fact that everything that is occurring to us has that little bit of delay, whether it be like, you know, the nerves from your fingers getting to your brain or your eyes, like th there's so much that's kind of just up in the air. And, you know, that's just like one of those points that I like to give when my wife starts making fun of me about believing in like, you know, random cryptids and stuff. But, you know, th there's it's an entire electromagnetic spectrum. We're only exposed to so much of it. And the entire time we're doing that, we're only, you know, it, it takes our body time to actually process. it. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It's been years since anything weird has happened to me. Um, but it, to me, it just makes life more interesting and more exciting when it does. And what better place than in the mountains, in the forest, <laughs> pretty much off grid, away from people, generally exper experience weird things here. So let's see, get, get back to the questions. <laughs> <laughs> Vitamin A, this is a kind of a never ending topic. <laughs> Nutrition detective, vitamin A is toxic idea and yeah i think this is something that people have run with because it's a fat soluble vitamin and as they a say fat it's not really a vitamin right it, it's, it's a, a toxin, toxin. <laughs> right yeah and it, i mean i came from a lot of people know the vitamin d is toxic camp and i was gung-ho about that for about three years hardcore and even before that i wasn't supplementing it so i'd say longer than three years i was in that vitamin d 
is not a nutrient camp. There was just something that fell off about that supplement. Now I have more of a balanced approach. We're kind of back to the alcohol discussion and substances in general. I think it's more about the dose, like the Paracelsus idea, the dose makes the poison. And I mean, you hear these stories of vitamin A therapy, even Ray Pete talked about high dosing it. It was 200 to 3000 IU. I think I have it bookmarked on my computer somewhere for different conditions. And we know Accutane is synthetic vitamin A, and that has helped people you know, with, with side effects, but reduce their acne, which I've experienced with. And I know genetically, I have a higher requirement for vitamin A because I have the gene mutations where I can't convert beta carotene from like carrots or peppers into retinol. So for people like myself that can't get vitamin A from, from beta carotene from the plants, I think that, it, you know, supplementing it occasionally. I think that's why I feel so good on cod liver oil. It's such a concentrated source of vitamin A. When I take that in the winter, I feel like a superhero. I feel like I can go outside like without my shirt and so shovel snow and I'm like steaming because I feel warm. Yeah, I forget the name of the book, but they were quoting a study where basically they had pigs and for one generation they made the diet of the mother like completely void of vitamin A. And when the mother had offspring, they were actually born without eyes. So, wow. you know, it, it, that, that's, I, I, I might be like forgoing some details, but I'm pretty sure like this is, this was one of those things where like I read, like I made a very significant like mental bookmark of that. But uh, yeah, I, I don't know. Like that whole argument just kind of falls out the window when you see stuff like that. And the fact that I'm not sure if it's Grant or the guy that basically came up with it and introduced mm -hmm. Grant to it, but he started that diet to like, fix his hair loss and he still does not have like a full head of hair so i mean maybe you know maybe he's just like that saturated with that vitamin a toxin but i i, I don't know like i i would hope if he's so religious about it i mean the guy basically lives off of like what rice black beans and like ground beef like he would have at least something to show for it yeah, it's a really and restrictive diet. It's incredibly restrictive. And, you know, because of that, like, it's not crazy to see like, oh, you know, I started doing this, I feel great. And it's like, yeah, what, a, what other crap did you cut out in the process? Yeah. Well, you mentioned the lack of eyes and my brain just goes to, okay, vitamin A, retinol, retina, and exactly. I, rhodopsin. Vitamin A activates apoopsin, which activates rhodopsin. So the rods and the cones... I mean, when you lack, I, I kind of have night vision like a cat currently, and I credit Father Royal vitamin A supplementation to that. I mean, yeah, I've been slamming dairy the last four years, but if you lack night vision, that is a sign of vitamin A deficiency. And I often test my night vision. I mean, I have it really dark in my cabin at night. And if I ever have friends staying here, they say, wow, I can barely see. And I said, what do you mean? It's bright to me. <laughs> I, can say I could pretty much walk. And I did last night walk around in pitch black and see where I'm going. I think that's a good test to do for your vitamin A levels. You don't need to spend money. Just see how your night vision is. Yeah. And also, if I'm not mistaken, eye color has a effect on that. Like I think people mm -hmm. with lighter eyes, like blue eyes, are, have better night vision, whereas people with darker eyes have um, an easier time seeing the sun. Mm -hmm. So. You know, it, it's just the vitamin A and I link is so like intense that I, I genuinely think that that basically like kind of squashes that argument. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Just just painting nutrients as toxins just doesn't make sense mm. uh, to me. But kind of on the same track here, someone asked acne and skin like eczema. Yeah, role of nutrients for that kind of a. Broad question, but yeah, I just posted a show on eczema with Abby Bradford. She shared a lot of great information on it, even saying limiting dairy, kind of focused to children, just limiting dairy for a time as they heal because dairy can be very aggravating to eczema and skin conditions. And it's been my experience with the wrong dairy, even raw dairy, I've broken out even just after 
a week or two of just drinking a lot of raw milk if it's doesn't agree with me. Up here, generally in North Idaho, I have excellent sources of dairy and I have never broken out from it. Um, but yeah, vitamin A is related to that, right? With skin health. Yeah, absolutely. I think just like, you know, making sure you're getting all the fat solubles and then just, you know, having a good quality sweat a few times a week will clean up your pores. And then obviously just, you know, washing off after that and making sure nothing's like gunking up your skin. Like uh, if it's like face acne, change your pillowcase more often just like limit the amount of exposure that you know something that could be clogging your pores is having time against your skin and yeah i, I get some sun get the vitamins sweat and I, I do nothing for my skin my wife is constantly like enamored by how like flawless it is and it's one of those things where like you know she does all of her routines and like you know alba's got great skin but like i do nothing and it's like you know, it, as long as you're eating right and specifically eating things that agree with you, like you were saying, like if you're having dairy that doesn't agree with you, then, you know, it can kind of cause issues because I'm sure it's like, you know, getting through like junctions in the gut and entering the bloodstream and just ending up there. And that's how your body is kind of trying to detox it. But um, yeah, just clean up your diet, make sure you're getting those nutrients and just sweat. Mm -hmm. And vitamin C and E are big. I mean, they use those in skincare products. C and E mm -hmm. are big for the skin. I think this is the last skin question. How to prevent and reverse sun damage to our skin. What's your current relationship to, to the sun? So last year, I did not use any sunscreen. I had one serious sunburn. And then after that, I was standing normally. And this year, Alba was able to finally convince me, I think for the first time in maybe like 15 years in my life to use sunscreen. And we just use like a quality like zinc oxide based one. And yeah, I not only did I not burn, but I also got tan through it. And it, it's it's just it really is like the sun is something that's so dividing when it comes to like health people. And I think the, the crowd that thinks like, you know, the unlimited sun exposure, you know, the whole light water magnetism people, like I, I really am starting to lean towards the idea that they're going to end up paying for it in regards to yeah. just like, you know, the lipofuscin on the skin, like the, the leathery looking skin, especially in later life. But you know, I, again, I think vitamin E is going to be like one of the biggest things you can do. And then obviously just like having like a quality, like moisturizer and just like making sure that your skin is like hydrated and nourished. I think that's going to be your best bet for that entire yeah. question. Well, I've seen the argument that <clears throat> sunscreen blocks the UVB part, which is what helps generate, you know, is required to generate vitamin D and it allows in UVA which actually has benefits, but is often called the damaging part of mm -hmm. UV light, but it can all cause DNA mutation and oxidative stress and excess. But I just think, well, okay, sunscreen on your neck, sunscreen on your nose, uh -huh. so the, the parts that are exposed. I mean, if you're still getting dosed in certain areas, maybe your arms, your legs, whatever, I don't think we need to get it daily. I mean, if it's a fat soluble vitamin, it's something that's stored. Yeah, and no, exactly. Like, how would we survive the winter up here when it's snowing if we couldn't store, store it? <laughs> and I think another point is that, like, you know, I think, you know, there's the people that, you know, just a little bit of exposure morning and night. So it's not intense, slowly build up the tan and everything. But that that's an investment of like time. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, my dad is definitely one of those people where he's like, oh, you know, like I burn once and then I can tan after that. But I noticed every time that I would burn, like my immune system would always take such a hit. And then it would be like a recovery from that just because, you know, like my skin was damaged. And, you know, that makes perfect sense because obviously like the body has to allocate resources to somewhere else. And, you know, they can't do other things to the degree that they should be. But, you know, it. I think if you're like very safe, like very just tapping the gas with like sun exposure, you definitely could get away with like, you know, getting a nice tan and like having a resistance to it naturally. But like, you know, that's going to be like 
I can't imagine how long of the process that would be like just thinking about like the time per day, like the weather effects, like, you know, it, you, you need like a perfect slice of heaven to kind of like get away with that. So honestly, like, I, I think I'm a, I'm a sunscreen person now and I never would have imagined myself saying that like even like three years ago. Well, another little meme that I hear often is there's no replacement for the sun where it's like, yeah, obviously it's, it's a very unique, you know, it's the whole rainbow. It's the milliwatt per centimeter squared. It's, you know, it's, it's going to be stronger than any device and it's going to be full spectrum and obviously it's natural. But I think the caveat there is in the winter, I mean, I've definitely noticed using like my narrowband Italian light, the 311 nanometer narrowband UV light, or it's a combination of UVA and UVB with red light. So in the winter, I'll use that for say five minutes and then I'll use the red light for like 20 minutes or something. I definitely feel a huge boost and I feel like the same effects that I get when I'm uh, sunbathing too. So it's, yeah, it's, it's a complex topic and, and I think it kind of depends on the environment that you live in. So I'm curious, John, do you, do you use red light, especially in the winter? I use it basically all the time. And I think, you know, I was dealing with back pain for the longest time. I tried using that and it honestly, you know, there's so much science with red light. I was really hoping that to be like the magic bullet, but I just started experimenting with it in different ways. And in particular, like pre-workout. And one of the ways that I was actually just completely blown away with like how powerful it can be. It's just like shining the light on whatever body part you're going to work out and for maybe like 15 to 20 minutes, depending obviously on like how far the intensity of the device, blah, blah, blah. But yeah, that was something where like consistently, if I did that, it was like a very good session. I would be able to like hit new maxes like consistently whenever I did that. And it's funny because red light in, I, I think, Andrew must have posted this, but it was some study in Brazil talking about like red light doping and how they're actually trying to like more or less screen people. I don't know how before they like compete in any sort of sport because it does have like that much of a benefit with just like, you know, the the term supercharge is a bit exaggerated, but it just like gets things running properly. So if there is any sort of dysfunction, even if it's just like, you know, something small, it's able to basically iron it out. And then you're able to perform at like a very, like at your highest level, basically. That's a good segue. Cause someone asked nutrition for athletes and supplements. And I think, I think we talked about this specifically in our, our first show together. You're a big fan of creatine, right? Yeah. So Creatine is just one of those things that, you know, I think anybody that like steps foot into like the fitness world is going to get exposed to, but there's just so much research with it. And something recently that I've been like kind of thinking about is the dosages for it, because so many times it's like, oh, like, you know, take five grams. And for the longest time I was of the mindset that you know, five grams is actually a little bit too much because like the whole creatine loading phase is just kind of gobbledygook. So I was doing three grams, but then I was seeing this one study where I forget the exact ratio of creatine to body weight, but basically like people were slamming up to like 20 to 30 grams of creatine in one go. And that was like, you know, not only physical performance, but obviously creatine has a cognitive effect too. And that was like generating some serious improvement. So that's basically going to be like the next little self experiment that I do. It's just going to be like proper mega doses of creatine. And that's in between meals or. Honestly, I don't think there's so much interfering with the absorption of it. And I know some people are like, Oh, I need to have it before the gym or after the gym. It, really doesn't matter the timing either just because that's something that circulates and gets saturated in the body yeah. so yeah because it just gets into the muscle right exactly so interesting yeah i'll have to experiment with that because my friend adam marfioti of lifeblood he recently came out with funny enough taurine like we were talking about mm -hmm. he has a toro which that's been out for like a year i think but 
he recently came out with glycine and creatine and mm. i've really been liking the creatine capsules but yeah to get up to the 20 grams that'd be a dave asprey handful of, of pills yeah, absolutely <laughs> but it's good on the go i mean that we did have a question about supplement stacks for different purposes and i think for me because i live rurally oftentimes my drives are five hours round trip or four hours or something like that and i found personally just keeping ascorbic acid vitamin c in my backpack creatine those are big ones sometimes i'll throw in their glycine um usually a cigar if i have time to <laughs> to smoke on the road when i'm outside of the car lately i've been liking keeping a cooler full of at least one of these like new brew kava kratom drinks which have 30 milligrams of caffeine and it's funny my caffeine tolerance seems increased even though i'm under tremendous amount of stress right now just for stressors with juggling life stuff just a lot of logistical things i don't know if it's the b6 i've been taking since my oligo scan showed low on vitamin b6 and uh, that's kind of a calming nerve it's a nervous system supportive nutrient and so I've been playing around with like 100, 150 milligrams of vitamin B6, P5P form, the active form a day. And I honestly feel like that alone's increased my ability to handle caffeine. It's been kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. One of my favorites is just aspirin and K2 because that is basically like a very easy way to like uncouple your mitochondria a little bit. So and you're generating like more heat and energy and that, that's one of those things like th there's this one uh substance called dnp 24 dinitrophenol that's basically a it's fertilizer it's explosive but if you take it you're going to just almost completely like uncouple your mitochondria and all that energy that's going to them is actually going to be turned into heat there the energy that comes out of it is going to mainly become heat instead of just like further energy down the line so it's interesting because you you get super hot you're almost constantly sweating but because of that like your body is just like melting through fat so any sort of like uncoupling of the mitochondria can just like help expedite with weight loss and stuff it's you know there's degrees of it obviously aspirin and k2 is what i would actually recommend instead of something like dmp but it, it's interesting because i think i've seen articles that like low dose dmp because it's such a potent mitochondrial uncoupler can basically like aid in almost any sort of like chronic metabolic dysfunction and it's hmm. it, it's really dangerous on one hand but also the potential when you're using it correctly is like kind of insane because you know i full transparency like i've experimented with it in the past and the recommended dose is something like you know anywhere between like 200 and 400 milligrams of course me being the little scientist that i am i tried 800 milligrams and i literally felt like a zombie except instead of like craving brains i was craving water and electrolytes because i was just constantly like moist with sweat and just feeling like death but like you melt fat it's actually kind of crazy and it's one of those things where like you know i think in the early 2000s it was something that would be in like a bunch of like over-the-counter fat burners and then people got stupid with it and like ended up like in a bathtub filled with ice just trying to hang on to life but on the other hand if you're using like a more i guess micro therapeutic dose because it has such like again like going to what we were talking about earlier it acts on such a foundational level that like the ramifications of it can kind of affect the entire body dnp yeah i, I looked it up that so it's in like a lot of like fat burner supplements like combinations it was but now it's like completely illegal. okay yeah. interesting yeah it's funny well first before we move on aspirin i often think it's like a poor man's vitamin e like if someone's in in another country or you know they're hard on cash or whatever and they can't afford like mixed tocopherol vitamin e because i i would not recommend taking just alpha tocopherol long term because there's like a cancer concern 
but that is only because it's not with gamma to coferol. So if you look at the research, it's really the gamma and alpha isomers. When you take those together, that's where it actually lowers cancer risk. But we're talking, I mean, if you take alpha to coferol for a year or two, like I did, it's fine. But I'm talking about if you take it for decades, you want to take the mixed. Would you agree with that? If someone's eating out and they're, you know, eating a, a meal with canola oil or peanut oil or chipotle or something. Yeah. Aspirin could be helpful. Absolutely. Just because it's going to help with just like, you know, shifting the balance of like fatty acid oxidation and glucose oxidation. It's just, it's, it's so protective. Like mm -hmm. I, I forget who said it, but it was something along the lines of if aspirin was discovered today, it would be illegal because of how it works for almost everything. Yeah. And, you know, you have the people yeah. that take like their baby aspirin and daily. And then you have people like me who've taken like up to five grams of aspirin in one go. And, you know, it, it definitely does a lot. And I think even like, you know, I, I think the regular aspirin is like 375, 325 milligrams. Even taking like two or three of those with your coffee in the morning, I think that's going to be something that like you feel throughout the day just because of how that that's genuinely like an easy way to supercharge yourself and absolutely something that I think should be in like, you know, your car's little like travel first aid kit type of thing. Yeah. Yeah. I'll put a link in the notes. I like Ray Pete's article. I read years ago, aspirin brain and cancer because it's such a demonized supplement, but I, I think it's definitely one to, to have, like you said, in the first aid cabinet. So you brought up like the body heat thing. I'm actually going to be experimenting probably this winter with like short little cold, cold bath things, <laughs> cold bath uh -huh. experiment. And I've gone back and forth with it. I was doing it, I don't know, six years ago. And I think I was soaking like my favorite temperature was actually like 57, 58 Fahrenheit. I know a lot of people get down into the thirties and lower. For me, that was the sweet spot where I found I got all the brain benefits. If I went above 60, like 61, 62, I didn't feel the same buzz. Mm. Uh, but like between that 55 and 60 for me is perfect. And I'm probably going to start doing, you know, two to three minute, like in and out. I think Leo, Leo Wick talked about it on my show, you know, cause he's native Russian <laughs> that we're not really designed to like Wim Hof sit in there for 10, 15, 20 minutes. Mm. It's like a dip where you get in and out and no supplement has actually given me that same feeling that cold therapy was just like a, a brain high. And you say, Oh, it's just stress hormones, but I actually felt like grounded and great. So I'll be playing around with that this winter. And I, I haven't decided if I'm going to be doing it indoors or outdoors yet. I mean, I've talked about living in a climate like we do in the North, just going outside in the winter is cold therapy, you know, getting yeah. that on your yeah. face, on your skin. But there is something to be said also of just the water exposure versus air. Mm. This water is a lot more intense. Um, you're not doing any of that right now, are you, Michael? Uh, no, but I, I honestly, in my entire history of like doing all things like weird and health related, I think the closest I ever got to consistently was just like cold showers. And that was, that wasn't even like completely cold showers. Like I would have a regular shower and then like, you know, right after I finish, I'd stand in there with like, you know, the dial into like the coldest setting and just try and hang out for like a minute or two and yeah you definitely feel that like more adrenaline going and that's definitely like stimulating to the point where like i think i've when i was doing that like i just completely like stopped coffee because i didn't feel like i needed it mm -hmm. or you just combine them no <laughs> oh yeah it's super wired <laughs> well on the same the same topic on supplement stacks do you have one for like pre-interviews or a lot of mental work that you do that's different things you take or huh definitely you're talking about nicotine yeah i was right about to say nicotine. <laughs> I, I, I mean it, it's crazy just because like i envy the people in the 40s where they were just like working at their typewriter pumping out like newspapers and stuff and they're just chain smoking the entire day without a care in the world inside because you know it's funny like the people that are still like like exclusively smokers you know like if you want that buzz you need to pop outside you smoke you come back in and by the time you're like ready to go like you know it's basically already gone and that's why i definitely like more sublingual things or some mm -hmm. people i guess but just like um snus is my favorite thing like the the 
nicotine from it is perfect. It's pasteurized, so it doesn't have any, I think, nitrates. So there's like really no downside to it. And it's really popular in like Nordic countries and they have incredibly low levels of, or excuse me, rates of cancer and other like mm. things you would expect of a population that's using a lot of tobacco products, but because it's, you know, obviously not smoked, it's just so much safer. But uh, yeah, before an interview, I think coffee, shilajit, nicotine, and honestly, right now, like I, I'm trying to keep it like pretty minimal. So I, yeah, I, I would say that's it. Trying to see, I, don't, I think they actually stopped selling it. I just looked on a uh, mountain rose herbs. They used to have a smoking blend, which I still have a, a pound of it. <laughs> and I've actually been enjoying that, which is mullein, like, like skull cap, uh, corn flowers, blue lotus. And I've actually been really enjoying like alternating that and tobacco. And I find that's a really like calming grounding. I mean, I actually have mullein growing here all over the property and it's all over here in North Idaho and it's great toilet paper actually in a SHTF scenario. No. Um, that's your, your natural toilet paper is mullein because it's kind of like this soft furry leaf, but smoking it actually is very I think it's called an expectorant. So it actually helps expel mu mucus out of the lungs. So that's, that's been part of my, my stack, but yeah, pretty much all the, the same stuff that we've been talking about is kind of my mental, like this morning I took niacinamide, elk velvet antler, which to me is just like a total body enhancement, magnesium, shilajit, kind of the basic stuff. Yeah, I think when you cover the bases well, there really isn't so much of a need to like fixate mm -hmm. on something for like each particular thing. Like, mm -hmm. I wouldn't even consider the fact that, like, you know, I, I take all these supplements, but like none of them are for working out. It's mm -hmm. because like I support myself so well that I have no problem working out. But one did come to mind it's a PRL853 and with a name like that, you know, it's got to be good. But that at dosages of like five to 10 milligrams in the gums, it numbs the gums, which I think is pretty cool, but that just like laser focus off of that. Wow. Is that on that, like a nootropics website you can get it from or? Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Trying to see if there are any other, how to look younger. It's a very broad question. <laughs> uh I don't know, progesterone on your face and just being healthy. Say lowering stress. I mean, for me, yeah. like going outside has been a huge priority, especially the last few years. It's like no music, no podcasts, no earbuds, just looking out at the mountains or the trees and listening to the birds chirp. And it's a little harder in the winter. I mean, I think that's more of like a meditation time <laughs> inside. Mm. Yeah, I think the biggest thing for stress is just going to be able to like be comfortable with yourself, you know, mm -hmm. because I feel like so many times like people, you know, they go on a walk, but they're listening to something because they, you know, by chance can't really stand the thought of being with their own thoughts, you know, like I, I think being able to work out what's in your head and just like spend time with yourself kind of is going to impact just your stress overall and just make you kind of a more just a better person. Oh, yeah, I think if you have access to it, the best test for that is a sensory deprivation flotation tank. Because a lot of people within getting in one of those within the first five to 15 minutes, you're hit with a wave of anxiety because mm -hmm. it's literally just you and your thoughts. And once you get beyond that point, um, you actually just get into the state of Lists where your nervous system finally unwinds and you didn't realize how tense you've been. Yeah, it's just crazy that, like, so many, like, I think it's safe to say that the majority of people have, like, at least one crux where it's just constantly, like, eating up their time and occupying their brain. Like, there's so many things now, like, you know, for example, like TikTok or Reels or just like, you know, any sort of social media to some degree is basically like time travel because you start and then you're just, you're going through it. And then suddenly it's like, you know, 30 minutes, it could be like an hour later, 
And the entire time you're doing it, like chances are you don't even remember like the last reel that you were watching. So it, it's crazy just like how much there is that can occupy your mind that leads it to just, you know, literally becoming uncomfortable with itself. I think, yeah, circling back to when we started this show, like living rurally, homesteading. And for me, I'm pretty remote. And my closest friends or a drive a pretty significant distance and recently i went to a house party last weekend and it's the same scenario you were talking about i looked at my phone just to check the time because i was lost in conversation smoking a cigar with these guys and oh wow i'm gonna get home at 10 30 i better go but that's a lot better than you know being home on your phone and realizing that where you're actually out side mm -hmm. of the house, socializing with people, which is I think much healthier for the brain generally. And you know, there's upsides and downsides to both, <laughs> but yeah, um, absolutely. But I, I mean, one is actually, you know, you, you can go to a party. You can not really talk to anyone. You can not jive with anyone really, but you're still like getting out there. And, you know, I think that, social contact even if it isn't exactly what you want it is still going to be a benefit especially when the alternative is basically just like dopamine hijacking and just like watching a screen as the minutes and the hours like tick by yeah yeah i think that's that was one of the things that I wanted to talk about was the the dopamine hijacking with technology and working on a computer like like you and i do a lot of the time it's definitely a balancing act of of protecting the brain and i think that is where like a quick cold soak could be a benefit because there's a benefit there with the dopamine but there's so many other so many things i mean i'm fortunate to have all these little health stations i set up to where my therify plasma device which is huge investment <laughs> but i'll just part of my routine every day is laying there in between these four high voltage plasma fields above a big coil under the massage table and just listening to a podcast for 12 minutes. And sometimes I just fall asleep there because I'm so relaxed and I wake up, you know, feeling like I just did a power nap. So yeah, finding, finding little things you could do outside. Yeah. Especially just like meaningful stuff as a whole, no matter mm -hmm. how small, like anything like, you know, back to gardening, honestly, like mm -hmm. you don't really need that much space to start a garden. And I think most people can even get away with just a few like pots on a balcony if you yep. only want like specific stuff. But I think we're just so altered by society as a civilization that, you know, we expect dopamine to be like a button to press away when in reality, it's something that's kind of cultivated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, favorite book in school growing up on the curriculum was brave new world <laughs> with the the soma drug yeah and how the whole world is just sedated into this kind of just complacence comfortable you know like comfortably numb like the pink floyd song uh, <laughs> and i feel like we're already there uh pretty much yeah no basically i mean <laughs> if it wasn't the phones like it's just going to be like the way that society is trending you know and it's it's crazy how it's literally you know, it is our happiness system, but it's just being used against us so much. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And just the, yeah, it kind of promotes, uh, the algorithm kind of promotes cortisol production <laughs> through the more engagement and how you get engagement is being controversial mm -hmm. and then arguments and people are arguing in the comments and it's just so easy to get lost in that. So I think breaking that cycle. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so what kind of wrapping this up, John, where where can people find you and what are you are you offering anything right now like coaching or what? So they can find me at johnthesavage.com, throwing it back to Brave New World, of course. I did my <laughs> Jim Jim Morrison thing where he quoted Aldous Huxley with the doors of perception and naming the band the doors. I just I want to put this out there because I'm not John the Savage, like I'm like, oh, I'm some beast in the gym. It's John the Savage from a Brave New World. So <laughs> but yeah, johnthesavage.com. I'm doing all my coaching, all my training. If anybody's interested, either shoot me a message there or, you know, reach out on Instagram.
Awesome. Yeah, I think you've seen I'm still on the resistance bands, which I like. I just like the the small time investment, but similar to what you were saying, when you're constantly moving and you're living mm-hmm. lifestyle like we are, there's certain periods where like, wow, I've already I've been walking all day. I've been moving my body all day. It's oh, kind yeah. of you feel like you already got your workout in. So that's the state that I've been in recently. But. Yeah, absolutely. Like even just like if I have to bring anything to the garden, like if I have to make like more than three trips, like that's already basically a mile. So, you know, the steps add up, the movement adds up. And, you know, that's just part and parcel of the whole like home setting life, I guess. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Well, yeah, this was a fun coffee chat. It's been a while since I've done one of these. I think people will get get some good nuggets out of here. I think we covered a lot of stuff. So, All right. Awesome. Yeah. Man. Thanks. Well, stick around as we close out the show. Thanks, John. Well, I hope you guys got something out of that, whether it was inspiration that you don't need to go the off grid homesteading route if you don't want to, or whether it was the B1 Simon and taurine information, which I think is great to get out there because I see a lot of people, usually women that have caffeine intolerance and they have to do decaf. And I do believe that there are inherent benefits to not just coffee, but even just caffeine itself. And as I mentioned, I'm going to put the repeat article on aspirin in the show notes. He also wrote one on caffeine that I've referred to a lot the last few years called caffeine, a vitamin-like nutrient or adaptogen, which is just so counter to what you hear because it's so demonized. You hear about adrenal fatigue. People say it's like alcohol. There's no benefits to it. It's just a stimulant. It's empty energy. And I completely disagree. I think caffeine by itself is medicinal, but when it's combined with all the other components in coffee, it's incredibly healing potentially if it's balanced with nutrition. For years when I was experimenting with intermittent fasting, I was having coffee on an empty stomach in the morning, either with stevia and fat or in my more extreme days, just black coffee with no fat with a sweetener like stevia. And that definitely increased my stress levels over time and caused this chronic kind of fight or flight condition. But once I added back in breakfast, especially the protein part of it with supplementation, that's where I felt like I could actually consume several cups of coffee in a day And I really think it's because I dialed in my nutrition and supplementation. So I love that John brought up thiamine and taurine. I'm definitely going to be experimenting with megadosing taurine. Amino acids are one of the safest things that you can megadose because they're just protein. If you're interested in trying that, especially in capsule form, my friend Adam has the company Lifeblood. We both have biodegradable bottles. They're called bio bottles. And he recently released a taurine supplement called Toro. It's just one gram of taurine with no excipients, no binders, and then a bottle that breaks down in a landfill. And I love taking that every day. Even if it's just one gram, I feel the difference taking that one. If you'd like to work with John, or check out his research, you can go to johnthesavage.com. And I have no affiliation with this website, but after the show, John realized that he misspoke on the Nootropic website. So he actually meant to say cosmicnootropic.com when we were talking about Fenibut and some of these unique uh, Russian pharmaceutical compounds. My website is matt-blackburn.com. You could read about my CLF protocol. I'm working on upgrading that and making it easier to read and then putting in some new information. On that website, I have all my recommended products. You can see nine of them there, which I shuffle every so often on the main page. 
have the MitoLife drinking water filter, seven stage filter that we designed from scratch. And then there's my favorite ozone generator, cold quartz ozone from Crucial 4. My favorite red light company that's from Gemba Red, a CO2 or carbon dioxide air bath. It's a bodysuit. If you can't afford a hyperbaric chamber, I highly recommend looking into CO2. I'm working on getting a show lined up for you guys all about the health benefits of carbon dioxide. Then I have Zeocharge on that front page. I've been taking six scoops a day of this zeolite. It's not liquid form or nano. It's just high grade, high purity, powdered zeolite. And I had a show with Jeff Hoyt about this. And it's a really charged topic. People get really triggered by it just because there's been so much marketing all around. Some people say it'll give you aluminum toxicity or it won't balance your minerals or it'll strip you of your minerals. Before you just write it off, highly recommend listening to my zeolite show with Jeff Hoyt. That's H-O-Y-T because he shared some really mind-blowing information that I had never heard about zeolite. Then there's that taurine amino acid on the front page from Lifeblood you can check out. Once again, if you're intolerant to caffeine, you might want to do a taurine experiment and see if just increasing your liver's ability to store glycogen helps you with caffeine tolerance. Then I have the Blue Shield portable unit there. I don't leave the house without it, but I still tell people this scalar emitting device, it doesn't shield your body from EMFs. It's just kind of providing an anchor, a signal that your body would prefer to listen to instead of the chaotic signals around you. This is secondary to nutrition and foundational supplements, which I consider vitamin C, vitamin E, magnesium, zinc, shilajit, put melatonin in there. If you're overwhelmed from that list, I would say just vitamin C and vitamin E, but obviously the more you stack, Nutrients don't work in isolation. Everything works together in the body. I would really target all of those for your basic EMF protection internally. Then I have the light water. I drink usually one whole bottle when I do a sauna session, and that's like doing a water change. My body, so a huge fan of the deuterium depleted water. I'm on a subscription of that, and I get that every month. And I definitely believe it's a legitimate science. And I've had a show with Victor Sagalovsky and Robert Slovak about it if you go to YouTube and search MitoLife Deuterium. And then the Swiss Dream Bed. That's my favorite bed. There's no metal. It's just pure wool and a wooden frame with a slat design. There is a biohacking version of this I used to see at health conferences that was over $10,000. This is around $2,000 and It's a super quality bed. I've seen beds double that price that are made of just garbage materials. This is the highest quality bed you can get from CBH Wood Furniture. So that's there on the front of my website as well. And then MitoLife is my brand. You can find that at mitolife.co. We have a lot of different products. As I mentioned, water filter. We recently came out with small batch coffee. Current batch is from Brazil. Sell very clean shampoo and conditioner. We have grounding sheets, which you can ground yourself rod to earth. It's kind of like an extension cord for your body to touch the earth while you sleep. And then under the wellness tab, you can see all of these supplements that we sell. A lot of them are on sale right now. So if you've been curious to try anything, now is a good time. And check out our Instagram just at MitoLife on Instagram. We put a lot of information on there as well as the newsletters. We're just really heavy on the information side of things. I noticed with a lot of brands, they're just all marketing. I actually want to provide tons of free information to everybody. 
And we put a lot of time and money and energy into doing that. So that is all for today. I have some exciting shows lined up for next month. I'll see you guys for next Friday's show. Stay supercharged. Thank you.